Hey everybody, it's Dan, the Get School Dude, once again with another Git tutorial video. Today I'm going to be teaching about Git LFS, which is a large file storage. So this is a nifty little add-on to Git. It's not part of Git itself, but it's pretty seamless to use. Git LFS provides a better mechanism for storing large files compared to using vanilla Git because it stores pointers to large files instead of the files themselves. Then, through the magic of Git LFS, those files are retrieved as needed when checking out to a state of the repo that needs those files. So you might be asking, why would you want to store large files in a Git repo to begin with? Well, there's a bunch of legitimate use cases for this, but the most popular by far is when you want to use Git in the gaming industry. So game development notoriously contains a lot of binary assets like character models, levels, textures, and this kind of application is really where Git LFS shines. And Git LFS is built directly into GitLab, GitHub, Bitbucket, and probably a bunch of other Git front ends we've never even heard of, which means that 99% of users are never going to have to worry about the complicated server side bits of the tool. Since this is an introduction video, I'm going to be showing you the client side usage of Git LFS with a hands on example. Let's get started. If you watch my channel, you already know that Git is a distributed version control system, which means that every clone has the full history of the repo, so get over it. If you track your large files using Git LFS from the beginning, your repo stays nice and clean, making clones fast and sexy. So we're going to be using our Hello World repo today, which we use almost every video, and you could see that our Git status here is clean, and you could do a quick look at how big is the .git repo. 912 kilobytes. Pretty dang small, right? So in a couple minutes, we're going to add some large files to this repo, push them up to the GitLab origin, and then just have a good time exploring the tool. Most Linux distributions have Git LFS built into their package manager. For example, I'm on Ubuntu 19, and I can simply sudo apt install git LFS to bring the client down. Check it out. Unpacking git LFS, I now have git LFS on my local machine, which is really all you need to make this work. Installing Git LFS on the local client is required for everyone that's going to use it, but it's simple to do and we don't have to worry about the server side mechanism because we're going to leverage what's already built into GitLab, so it makes for a pretty clean workflow. If you're on some other platform, check out their documentation. All the instructions are there on how to install. So let's take a look at our Hello World repo here. If you look at Git status, you can see I'm on the master branch. I'm up to date with Origin Master, which is in GitLab and I have an untracked directory with a few files in it. And if you look under here, you can see I've created a one megabyte file, a 10 megabyte file, and a 100 megabyte file. There's nothing in it. We don't really care what's in the file. This is just a demonstration of the capability. I'm gonna put everything under this directory in the Hello World repo, this huge directory, but they can be anywhere in the directory tree. So it's crucial that if you want to use git LFS, you should start from the beginning because if you've already git added, so for example, if I git add, huge like this, this is enough to put that content, the one megabyte, 100 megabyte, and 10 megabyte files into the history. So you have to first initialize your repository to quote unquote install git LFS in this repository. And the way you do that is by just typing git LFS install. And you can see it updated some git hooks and we're good to go here. So if you're curious what it did, you can actually look at the .git hooks directory and you can see that it's installed a pre-push, a post-merge, post-commit, and a post-checkout hook. Now, you don't have to worry about these hooks unless your project already has hooks that conflict, but we're not gonna worry about that today because it's just an introduction video. The next thing you have to do is tell Git LFS what kind of file you'd like to track. And in this case, all the files we wanna track have the extension .file. I just made that up, but you typically do this for like .iso if you're gonna track an ISO, or whatever file extension is typically associated with a binary. And the way that you associate git LFS with a file type is by typing git LFS track and then the description here. So in this example, we're gonna use everything that ends with dot file. It tells us that it's ready to track dot file. And if you're familiar with git attributes, this is actually just adding some information to the dot git attributes file which is a really powerful mechanism to customize your Git experience, but we're not gonna talk about that today. Now that we've told Git we wanna track these large files, we can simply Git add the contents of the huge directory. Git status shows that we've added them. 
and you'll notice that our .git directory grew to 100 megs. You might immediately be reacting like, wait, Dan, you said that the history wasn't going to get bloated. Well, if you look at what it's actually doing, it's putting all these files under a new directory called LFS. Now, what's interesting about git LFS is that this directory does not travel with the repository. It gets created as we add content or as we check out to locations that require LFS content. If that doesn't make sense, hang in there. I'm going to show you exactly what I'm talking about in a minute. So our huge files are added to the index. We, of course, need to git add the git attributes file because that travels along with the repository. Now we can make our first commit with these large files. The next step is to create a topic branch so we can push this out to the GitLab origin. We made our commit on the master branch. Let's go ahead and just create a new branch at that location. Let's go ahead and push this branch with the new large file content to origin. Now you can see that the hook has intercepted the push and it's doing some magic behind the scenes to essentially upload the LFS object. So I have Comcast internet, which isn't great. We'll fast forward to when this is completely done. Here we can see the LFS push is complete and the rest of the git push has finished down here. So this branch is now available in origin to be fetched by other users of the project. So we push the branch to GitLab, and if I flip over, you can see that I've created a merge request with that branch right here. So it's not yet merged into master. Now, before we do anything else, I'm actually gonna clone the repo into a second area to show you the size of the repo. I'm gonna back up a level, git clone, and I'm gonna clone it into hello2, which is just a temporary directory for this demonstration. So here we go. You see the clone was instantaneous. If I go into hello2, and I do a du of the .git directory, you can see that we're still very small. So your next logical question is probably, how do I get those large files? Well, you'll notice that by default on a git clone, we're getting the default branch, which is master. As soon as we check out to the state that needs the big data, which is this branch or this remote tracking branch, you'll see what happens. So let's go ahead and do that. Git checkout origin 11 git LFS demo, let's go. So what's happening here is the git hook is intercepting the checkout, grabbing the large data files, and we're pretty much good to go. Now if I do a ls, you can see that we have the files under the huge directory, and the size of .git is now 107 megs. Because it downloaded everything and put it in this .git slash LFS folder. Now one thing that's cool about this is you can switch between branches and it will not go out to get data if it has already cached it in this .git LFS directory. So you can see that I now am on origin master and I could create a new branch at the location of this remote tracking branch for issue 11 and it instantaneously creates it. We're on that branch which is coincident with what is in origin and what I'm trying to point out here is that it doesn't go out to get the files every time. It will cache large files in this area and retrieve them as necessary. So really you only have to retrieve the files once. So another thing I want to point out is that GitLab actually when you're using Git LFS it will show you which files are under LFS control. So if you go over to the repository and find our branch where we've added this content, you can see these markers under this huge directory. LFS. So this just means that GitLab understands that these are LFS files, which is pretty cool. These files are binary, and if you know anything about Git, you know that Git can't merge binary files. So what I want to do is change this file here in our hello2 repo, push it, change it in the hello regular repo, and see the merge conflict happen. So that's what we're going to do next. Here I'm just changing my branch name to match what's in origin, and I'm going to use this command to just tweak this file by one byte, we don't really care what's in it. Git status will now show that we have changed this file. So I can git add the file and commit it as we normally would. Now we're ahead of origin by one commit, so let's go ahead and push this change. Now if I switch over to my regular hello repo, 
remember this is the repo where we started all of our work and git status will show that we're on that branch if i do a git fetch it will learn about the updates to origin now it's important to note that on this fetch we're getting the pointers to the lfs files not the lfs files themselves and we're going to do something similar on this side we're going to change the same file so we've changed the content of this file let's go ahead and commit that locally So we're about to perform a merge of the remote tracking branch with this name into our local branch in this repository. We know it's changed on the other side. We changed it locally. We should expect a merge conflict. Let's go for it. You can see that we've hit the merge conflict we expect. Now we have to resolve the conflict. Let's just go ahead and pick theirs. And we've checked out theirs, so now we can add it git commit to resolve the conflict. So if you're still with me on trying to learn this, I got a question for you. Now, we've changed this file locally in our hello branch. We have not pushed our branch yet, but we did merge with the change from the hello2 repo, which was pushed. So my question to you is, when we push this commit, where we resolve the conflict using dash dash theirs, meaning we took their version of the file. Do you think a push on this branch to origin will upload anything through Git LFS? Let's find out. Yes. Now this might be confusing at first. You can see it right here. So the upload happened. Now you might be wondering, well, what had to upload? You know, we made a local change, but then we resolved the conflict to dash dash theirs, their version was already in origin. But this is actually correct behavior because remember before we made the merge, we committed a new version of our one megabyte file. We made a new version of this locally. And so commits are local actions. The history of the branch locally still has the commit where we tweaked this file, even though the very next commit, we resolved a conflict using dash dash theirs. Let's take a look at the graph view. If you didn't follow me there, let me just show you in the graph what I'm talking about. So you can look in the history here. This is the merge commit where we resolve the conflict, so 54DA. But you can see that this commit has two parents, D6FA, which was the first time we changed this file in the hello2 repo and pushed it, and then BEB6, where we actually changed the file locally on this branch. When we push, to origin on this branch. We aren't just pushing this commit, we are pushing all the commits that origin doesn't have on this branch, which includes this commit where we changed the one megabyte file for the second time. I hope that makes sense. But because Git's history is distributed, you get the full history in every repo, this is an illustration of why Git LFS is something that's useful. Let's say we weren't using Git LFS and we were managing large files just with vanilla Git. You can see in this illustration here that we're going to end up with two versions of the same file, even though we only really wanted one, the resolution of theirs. When we're using git lfs, we're just storing a pointer to the file, so we don't really care about having intermediate extra versions because those versions are only pulled down as necessary on the client side of git. That's pretty much it, guys. I just want to uh, finish with a couple closing thoughts. Uh, one question you're probably going to have is how big is big enough to use git lfs? It really depends on the project. I kind of think anything around the size of a meg or bigger should probably be using Git LFS. I've seen some people talk about anything bigger than 100 kilobytes, um, but really the intent there is that if it's a binary file, it should probably be tracked in Git LFS because it won't compress well. So like I said earlier, Git LFS is actually an add-on. It is not a native tool of Git, but the Git folks are really interested in supporting this natively. If you're interested in learning more, they actually have this Git conference, and if you just type that into YouTube, you'll end up on this playlist. And one of these videos is called Native Git Support for Large Objects. So it should be interesting to see how all that pans out. As always, thanks for watching. If you have questions, leave them in the comments section below. Do me a favor, hit that like and subscribe button. I'm Dan the Git School Dude, and I'll see you guys next time. <laughs>